following is unedited audio stolen from deep inside a political conspiracy that documents an ongoing effort to assassinate the character and take down the potential political hopes and dreams of a democratic politician. The audio has not been edited in any way. What you're about to hear is real and a real political conspiracy. Okay, so guys, obviously, this Beto guy is a problem. Yeah, we got to clap this go. fool. Has to happen. Go. I He's... mean, no one's ever planned for a German guy who pretends to be Mexican. It's actually kind of the smartest strategy. Well, I keep hearing more about 2020. This guy's young. He's attractive. He's charismatic. Um, he stands for everything that's right and good. He represents, I mean, even though he's, he's white, he represents the interests of POC in a way that, um, quite frankly, I'm not with. No way. I mean, he could possibly inspire the entire country to come together and defeat Donald Trump, which that goes in the way of our insane socialist uh, accelerationist plans. Anyone, I've, I've personally bought three condos in Trump Tower to accelerate conditions. You know, worst of all, he's out here making making women's calves cramp all over the place. <laughs> he's setting up expectations for about being a generous, uh, giving lover. We can't have that. No, no, we can't no. have that. We have spent years now setting women's standards very low for what to expect from bearded brochalists. And we're not going to have this guy filling them their heads with dreams of multiple orgasms and, and fancy dinners out. I heard that Beto O'Rourke can achieve triple digit orgasms. This has to be stopped. No, no, no. Yeah, I don't want to hear about it. I no, don't want to know about it. Not going to happen. There's only one thing we need to do, and that's coordinate a response. Absolutely. So let's get a, our agent in the Washington Post on the line. Yeah, let's get one of our shooters on. Let's here. get one of yeah. Let's get one Fred of Fred Hyatt. <laughs> <laughs> let's get one of our top shooters on this case. Mm -hmm. Put out the hit on Beto yeah, we're right now. We're putting a stack on Beto right I'm now. Putting stacks on his head. Calling up, calling up one of our top shooters. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, is this Liz Brunig of the Washington Post? Yeah. Hey, is this about taking Beto down? Yeah. Welcome to the political conspiracy. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah, I met up with Bernie in a parking lot last week to talk about this at around 3 a.m. Uh, and his feeling was that it was just too likely that Beto could beat Trump, and we can't let that happen. Can't let it happen, folks. Bernie, you know, he met you in the darkened parking lot, as you know, as you do in Washington, and he said, "Follow the triple-digit orgasms." <laughs> Follow the wherever like, wherever calves you know, are cramping. Uh, I wasn't going to let a champion for women win last time, and I'm not going to let a champion for women win this time. Uh, and so he deployed his A team, uh, including me and uh, David Sirota, with a couple tweets and Zed Jelani in current affairs. It's, it's wild that like we can coordinate so well in that like people among us who generally share the same political values and ideas could like come up that quickly with such a similar take on why Beto is is wanting. Again, and I'm glad I orchestrated all of this because, like, we need coordinated response, coordinated I mean, character assassination. You know, the, the reality is he's such a great left candidate that everybody on the left uh, was actually supporting him before Bernie uh, decided to put the hit squad together. So, I mean, it, it definitely took a high level of coordination. Uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, I know that Bernie has deployed every list served. He's held multiple meetings in undisclosed locations. Uh, you can look for more critical reporting about Beto, especially as he starts to uh, to put together an exploration committee and, and prepare to run. And of course, none of that is going to be uh, generated naturally by the, the news process. It's going to be all due to, to Bernie's work behind the scenes. And, and I know you guys are in on that. I mean, I just I hope the slack doesn't leak. Um, we are recording this political conspiracy just for our own files, but I hope it never gets out. Oh, man, that man. Would, we would be in so oh, much man. trouble. That would be embarrassing. I would get canned. But I mean, just, you know, for our own records and files, you know, here and, and you know, for the, for our tape, you know, it's like so we can plot out this conspiracy going forward. You know, just just what is the sort of case against Beto? Because obviously, you know, we have said on the show as part of this plan, again, as part of this double blind uh, conspiracy backtracking maneuver that we very much wanted him to defeat Ted Cruz for the Texas Senate seat. Uh, he didn't do that. But now people are beginning to uh, say, hey, Beto is, you know, he's going to be our guy in 2020. 2020. He's young. He's charismatic. He's got money. Uh, people like him. So just, you know, for our own records and purposes, you know, even though I know we both we gotta know. Get the we got to get the talking points down yeah. here. What is the sort of case against Beto as a 2020 Democratic presidential nominee, in your opinion? Well, the the problem with Beto that, uh, you know, when, when Bernie gave me his files, uh, seemed to be that he's uh, it's very wishy-washy on uh, 
health care, right? So uh, he doesn't support either Medicare for All bill in Congress. Uh, he's voiced support for single payer, but he won't put a policy to that. And he's also at other times said he supports universal coverage, but thinks there are a number of ways that we could get there, including something like a public option. So it's uh, difficult to pin down actually exactly where he is. And that appears to be uh, done on purpose, right? So he can kind of pull an Obama and be all things to all people. Uh, at the And then there's the, the kind of a middling voting record in Congress, right? He's not a progressive Democrat. He's part of the New Democrat Coalition. Uh, didn't really do much in Congress uh, and doesn't really actually seem to uh, push much legislation whatsoever, uh, needless to say, progressive legislation. And then there's all the you know real estate dealings in El Paso, where he's from, uh, some of which have put uh, you know poor old women out of their homes. Uh, so you know that's what we're working with, and we're trying to dig up more. You know, we're talking to the tweeters who are talking about the calf cramping and see what they have, uh, and they, they may know something we don't. Um, and, you know, it, it was reported that he just had a meeting with Obama's, you know, old campaign people. So, like, they, they clearly see something in him that they saw in Obama and which is, on, you know, honestly should frighten everyone. Oh, my God. And it's astounding. They're, they're out in the open about it. They're talking about how excited they are to have another Obama. And it's like, what do you think happened? He's like Obama won and he got eight years in. Congratulations. And I guess they're just thinking we just want to win again. And it's just such, I guess that's what happens when you're out of power. Your brain just dissolves because of all of the triggering you're getting from all of uh, every awful tweet and just President Cheeto being an embarrassment every day. But you have to do something once you win. And, and just being vague and, and offering platitudes and then governing that way, guess what? Congratulations. Maybe Beto can beat, beat Trump, especially if he has another well-timed uh, economic collapse, which certainly helped Obama win. Then in 48 years, congratulations and welcome President Anti-Semitic Times Square Elmo, because that's the inevitable result of that. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think there's some value in continuing to live the exact same cycle of our existence in 12-year uh, cycles every year, but they keep getting worse. They keep getting shittier. Yeah. And then we just die. It's a mind I think calendar. There's like, I think there's some value in that, in just reliving the same things, just with uh, more like little marginal factors made shittier every time. Like, you know, we get to relive 2008, but climate catastrophe is, you know, I honestly think there's some value to it. And I think you guys are sort of just out of hand poo-pooing the idea of a living purgatory with no end. Hey, and I'm, I'm with it, boys. Nietzsche, baby, eternal recurrence. Let's go. Well, I mean, Liz, obviously, like, I mean, we're joking about uh, the, this political conspiracy, but like you wrote a piece for The Washington Post that was, you know, a very m mild piece of, you know, criticism about Beto as a 2020 candidate that was just basically saying, like, here, pump the brakes on this guy for X, Y and Z. Uh, Could you describe a little bit of the reaction you, this piece got and what you think that portends? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, my feeling was after one of my colleagues at the Post reported that Beto was hanging out with Obama at his post-presidential offices in Foggy Bottom here in D.C., that, you know, the Democrats uh, were getting pretty serious about Beto as a candidate. My feeling was, uh, you know, it feels like we only go backwards. Um, we're, we're just picking candidates uh, who are, you know, uncommitted to progressive uh, values or in that new Democrat coalition zone. And, uh, of course, I, I have different politics than that. Um, and so my argument was like, look, if, if you're uh, someone who cares about progressive priorities, if you, you know, uh, you know, feel like uh, the Democratic Party has an opportunity here, which I do to actually uh, go to the left on some important issues, especially poll really well nationally, like single payer, um, then, you know, Beto's probably not your guy because it isn't as though uh, he uh, he comes from a conservative district. Right. He comes from a district, El Paso. Uh, Texas 16, that I think is 17 points more Democratic than the average district in the United States. Uh, so he has the opportunity to be as progressive as he wants, essentially, in Congress, and he hasn't done it. So my assumption is that's just not his politics. Uh, and so I, I wrote that piece, and then people said, uh, well, specifically near a Tandon of Cap, uh, <laughs> who was acquainted with my husband. Um, <laughs> she, she said, you know, this is a coordinated attack uh, that's coming from, you know, Bernie Sanders supporters, Bernie land. Uh, and then after, Gross. you know, she made that claim, lots of other people on Twitter uh, sort of echoed it. Uh, and I ended up talking to my boss about it and saying, you know, no, I'm not I'm an independent writer. I'm not taking orders from anyone. I, I didn't uh, meet up with Bernie in a parking lot and take a box of files and get to work. 
Um, I just, uh, you know, this is my personal feeling on him, but uh, I think that the reaction uh, to the to a, what is a very gentle critique uh, a couple years out from the general uh, was pretty telling about where the democratic powers that be are on Beto. That's I mean, amazing that they fucking made you go out to the pumpkin patch to find the microfilm with the instructions <laughs> from Birdie on it. That's amazing. Well, I mean, I, I, I think what's telling here is it's not so much that like uh, everybody loves Beto or wants to get her get, a, you know, rally around Beto, although I, I assume some of it is people are legitimately excited about him because he does sort of seem like feeling like white Obama. But I think it, it really speaks more to the fact as far as people like Nira and the Democratic Party liberal establishment goes is they want anyone but Bernie, Mm -hmm. right? It's Bernie is really what they're afraid of because I think they know that, like, you know, they can read a fucking poll. They know how popular he is. And uh, quite honestly, I know know this is, you know, we're years off. He might not even run. Shit, I mean, he's old as hell. I mean, it indicate it does seem to be like he's considering running. And I really think, as if it were held today, like, it's his nomination to lose. And I think, like, if you want to talk about coordinated attacks, I think they are coordinating all their energy to make sure that doesn't happen. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be a conspiracy. They don't share his politics and would not, they don't want to see the Democratic Party go in that direction politically. Right, right. So, Precisely. I think that they recognize that a big part of Hillary Clinton's problem in 2016 was she was never able to get the cool factor going, which is no small thing because it allows you to get the youth vote out and it allows you to get sustained attention. Um, Obama was able to both be a centrist and be cool. Clinton was not able to do that. In Beto, they see someone who can make, you know, sort of centrist, bland democratic policies cool. And so, you know, when the left comes along and preemptively rejects this guy they're setting up as like the youth candidate who's going to pull all of Bernie's support, basically, uh, they get really frustrated. And, and I, you know, I think that's a perfectly reasonable response to your political uh, plans uh, taking a little bit of a hit. Um, but I mean, I, I also think it's important for the left to understand, you know, this guy just doesn't share your politics. Well, that they don't think of it. That's what's so amazing watching the responses. They have this weird sense that no one should be criticized. No candidate should be criticized at all, that you just sort of have to let all of all these campaigns wash over your totally smooth marble like brain. And then, <laughs> I don't know, pick one out of a hat or whoever calls your house the most or whoever you shook hands with at a fucking flapjack dinner or something. There's just there's no sense that you're supposed to uh, uh, come to this decision with a actual, you know, political beliefs or policy uh, sort of red lines and that you're going to judge candidates based on whether they meet your criteria. They, they, they don't think of it that way. It's just it's just those, an extended marketing campaign and they bring it out the, the, the new hot product, which is this this cool uh uh, white guy, but he sounds like he might be Mexican, and we're not going to tell you he isn't. Uh, and what, what's not to like about that? Because as you said, yeah, like slapping a cool coat onto uh, centrism is uh, really all they have because the policies sure as shit aren't going to fucking excite anybody. Well, I I think they're like the new strategy, uh, getting me sick of the post. Uh, <laughs> you know, Eighteen months before they need to. Mission accomplished. Just stop it. Stop posting. Everyone go back to talking about this is us. Give me I was, just fucking nominate Chris Dodd. I don't care. <laughs> just do it. Be done. Stop it. Stop it. I don't want to see it. Well, Liz, I noticed uh, a, a big thing in the, in the reaction to, to your thing and, you know, this idea that this is all being coordinated. You know, let, let's grant for a second that it is that, you know, Bernie is like, I want Beto dead. <laughs> I want his family dead. I want his skateboard broken in half. <laughs> But the idea is like, you know, the, re- the reaction you've gotten to this is like, you know, oh, you're just trying to take him down. Uh, you know, like, uh, why won't you support the Democrat or whatever? And like the, the answer is it's just like they, he, they have to compete in a primary to be the Democratic nominee that in, and then invariably we're all guilted into supporting uh, when he runs against Trump. But like he hasn't got there yet. And until he does, it's very much an open contest. Right. I mean, uh one way you could interpret criticisms from the left is, you know, offering Beto the opportunity to pick up the policies that we care about. Um, but the, the democratic sort of centrist response was, you know, how dare you expect him to alter his policies in any way or try to reach a voting base? Uh, and, and I mean, you know, that's just how primaries work, right? We put our priorities out there. Candidates can decide if they want to respond or not. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily um, an, a destructive attack to communicate in the press you know, this is what a certain base cares about. 
Uh, but but I think, again, the response tells you he's not going to pick that shit up. Uh, and the, the Democrats who are supporting him do not want him to. And I right? think they're comfortable with him where he is. <laughs> and, you know, like uh, before Beto, it was like all Kamala Harris because like, you know, I guess she's kind of young and cool, too. <laughs> kind of <Yeah. laughs> both of those things. She's but like probably the coolest person <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I, you, know, you know, I, you know, uh, dude, I've seen uh, I've seen Vermont Senator Patrick Lee. <laughs> I know. Cool. But like it, it does seem like the, you know, Beto is in a lot of ways for, for instance, you know, the people who work at cap, the perfect candidate, because uh, for some inexplicable reason, people think he's uh, attractive and he has a skateboard and was in a punk band. And I guess like he in the, like, again, like we said with Obama, he can sell that vague sense that like, you know, he's everything Trump isn't. And it's just like we can pour into him. He's just this container with which we can pour, the the youth of America can pour into, you know, their hopes for a better future because he sort of like looks and sounds like one of us. But yeah. again, as you pointed out, like it's very, very, very important, not just for the future of America and the rest of the world, but the future of like, let's say, a Democrat winning the White House or being politically successful, that the nominee not be someone who uh, is cozy with Wall Street is willing to uh, turn health insurance over to private markets and insurance companies and uh, is not going to basically let the Pentagon and, and, and you know, military industrial complex uh, run foreign policy. And Beto has shown no indication that he's willing to uh, fight um, or, you know, push back on any of on any of these issues that he'd get in there and be what Obama was, which was someone who immediately bailed out Wall Street, started droning the entire world. And created this convoluted uh, compromise that was in health insurance or health care that was based on the Heritage Foundation's original, like, you know, sort of private public uh, partnership bullshit. Yeah, and was was politically weak and was shredded. And the only part of it that worked well and that remains are the Medicaid expansions. Right. So, I mean, I mean, you know, it, it all seems like we've been here before. And uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I hope that uh, I, I don't think it's too out of order. Um, you know, to say that, you know, we've, we've, we've gone down this road and it didn't work. I mean, uh, so there is, there would be a silver lining. If he got in there, you could see all the teacots calling him beta odoric. That's pretty good. <laughs> you know, they could call him the, uh, the, uh, the bay dungler. Oh, okay. Um, how about this? Beta O'Rourke was in a punk, punk band, right? Yeah. You got a figure for like the entirety of the eighties. He had a name like, you know, Jerry Piss, Jonathan <laughs> Shit, Craig Vomit, and classic S- punk Steve game. Puss. Yeah, that's not, you know, and he's going up against a respectable bu- a guy who's doing business deals in the 80s, <laughs> who presumably Donald Trump never, like, signed a loan or anything under the name, you know, Tommy Don- Sca- Donald Pussy or <laughs> Tom- something. Tommy Scabies. <laughs> yeah, Tommy Scabies, Rick Rabies, <laughs> any of those. And that's, you know, it's a problem. Sorry, we got to get him out of here. Liz, like, you know, uh, the, the other the other big thing that, that you hear a lot from uh, like the Beto people or like, you know, the the cap uh, mafia, uh, you know, was it Daily Coast just said this. He was like, you know, like Bernie supporters like that's just a cult of personality. <laughs> and like, I don't know if this is projection or what. Like, I mean, obviously, I, I, I against my better judgment, I find Bernie to be sort of a charming character. But like, I wouldn't say he's someone that's like overburdened with like a charismatic leader like presence would you say <laughs> no i i think it's like an anti-cult of personality where people uh who support bernie uh, appreciate the fact that he's sort of unpolished and shows up with like wrinkled suits kind of like he napped in the car on the way um because it bespeaks a, a lack of um uh, I mean, it, it's just, it bespeaks authenticity, right? He seems to, and he, he has the record to prove he actually gives a shit about the policies he's behind. And he doesn't seem like a workshopped uh, kind of, you know, focus grouped figure. Um, and so it's actually a cult of him not cultivating uh, a sort of public persona in I mean, the way that uh, a lot of candidates do. <laughs> because that's what, that's what allows the policies to be the leading thing because he right. does it because his plain, kind of one note and 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 uh yeah anti-charismatic style where he just sort of says the same thing over and over again about corporations and the one percent and all that uh it 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 just turns it upside down and it and it it undermines 
his personal appeal and it makes it expressly about the policy, which for people who are wary, at least they claim to be wary of, you know, uh, attempts for by politicians to use flash over substance, uh, it sort of disarms their uh, their instinctive, their inherent skepticism yeah. of a politician. And then they're like, oh, maybe he's actually serious about this stuff because he's not really, he doesn't have anything else. He's not skateboarding. You know, he, does, he's, he doesn't have the soaring rhetoric. Right. Yeah. And he seems to, he seems to not, um, he is not interested in developing a personality that can go in the center of a campaign, right? He just wants to put the policies in the center of the campaign. And that's really refreshing I think, for a lot of people who grew up with the opposite kind of formulation. Politicians who had personalities and personas like Obama and a lot of ways like O'Rourke, who are very, very vague about policies and kind of try to keep them out of the spotlight. It's more about hope and change and so forth. Uh, but you don't really know what you're getting. We are going to go into the White House. We're going to go up to Donald Trump. We're going to say, Mr. Trump, ya yeet. <laughs> <laughs> but Liz, I know we're like I don't it, even know what that means, but it's very humorous. Again, taken for granted that we are all part of the same conspiracy. We're all part of the same hypocrisy, Ms. Brunig. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that hypocrisy is politics and uh, you know, our our preferred uh candidates. You know, we're all we're we gotta tool up. You know, we gotta go to the mattresses for Bernie. So what are some things that, that you're looking forward to as we relitigate twenty sixteen again in twenty twenty? Like what are some of the best uh ARGs? Uh, for you know that we can uh, utilize against um, the the wretched the wretched dem. Well, you know, I mean, obviously we uh, we don't want women getting into any positions of power. Absolutely, uh, that was the original Bernie Sanders platform, uh, and it's it's no less important now. Um, you know, climate change is is uh, extremely. Uh, I mean, it's it's very pressing, right? So we don't have much time on it. So aggressive climate policy um, is more important than it has ever been before. Um, so candidates who take that seriously, uh, I mean, there's just, there's no good conscience picking a candidate who doesn't take it seriously or doesn't favor aggressive climate policy. It's, it's fatal otherwise. Um, and then, and similarly, um, you know, uh, the economy is not super stable. A lot of people are predicting another collapse. Um, you know, so unless we want to go to 2008 again, um, with bailing out the bankers and ignoring homeowners, uh, allowing, you know, people who are basically committing financial crimes to get away with it and then, uh, you know, punish the victims. You have to take a, a candidate who is ready to, to sort of go after Wall Street in a really aggressive way. Coming out of this most recent uh, midterm elections where the Dems, the Democrats did take back the House. But, you know, Matt Carp and others have pointed out that, like, while it's good that, you know, stopping reaction is always an important thing to do. And certainly this Republican party, if you look at how they won back the house, like they really did win with the, you know, the Panera bread suburban democratic voters who are mostly, you know, uh, middle to upper middle class and mostly, you know, moderate to center right in their political beliefs. So that like the democratic party is becoming more, is moving further and further away from being a party of, you know, the working class and more and more a party of sort of, educated uh, white suburbanites. It's a political disaster yeah. to, to abandon the working class. Um, and, and even the sort of lower income portions of the middle class, um, if you abandon them, someone will pick them up uh, and sort of already have in Trump a kind of table setting for a pseudo fascism. Um, and so, I mean, you know, you don't have to panic too much or predict too much, but um, you know, if you if you continue to move in a direction that people identify as being sort of elitist and removed from the people and anti-populist, that energy is going to go somewhere. It's already there. Uh, and so the Democrats can decide whether they want to respond to it and channel it into a movement or whether they want to ignore it and continue with business as usual and roll the dice and see what happens. Look at what's happening to Macron in Europe right now. It's not good. I mean, look, Macron, I think he's going to turn it around, though. In all seriousness, like he's... He's going to go up. He's going to like tell, tell a worker to take overtime so he can buy a suit. He's going to marry some more teachers. He's going to do what he has to do. He's going to make that crazed look that looks like he's just been drinking amoeba water for 12 years. <laughs> he's going to say that he's a god. He fucking... You know what? Uh, Macron filled up this space in sort of liberal culture that a void that Kanye left because <laughs> he's sort of like uh Jesus era Kanye yeah I am a god uh he's a god he is he's a god on earth uh, he's gonna start giving all the speeches from behind a curtain 
just his outline <laughs> and his, maybe his bejeweled hand will come out to wave to the crowd. You know what Macron is like? You know how we always make fun of the guys who are like, they watch uh, The Sopranos yeah. or uh, whatever, and they're like, this is about cool guys. Macron watched Gladiator, and he looked at Joaquin Phoenix's <laughs> performance and was like, this is about a cool emperor who sabotaged <laughs> yeah. to be like him. If he'd only lived, he would have fixed all of Rome's problems. But I mean, obviously, whether these protests are, uh, you know, right wingers mad about an environmental tax or whether there are generally anti austerity, I mean, probably a little of both is true there. But I just want to read this one uh, Twitter exchange between someone and, you know, Neera Tandon, as long as we're talking about her. You know, the person who, let's be honest, is like the biggest hurdle to the Bernie conspiracy. You know, we're gonna, you're going to have to deal with Nira it's eventually. It's tough, man. She just keeps figuring out all of our moves. She's one step ahead. She's just her posting is too strong. So and I want to talk about some of her posts. And I just want to talk about this interaction that she had with someone on Twitter. Uh, someone's responding to her and they say, because Macron cut taxes for the wealthy and now he's trying to force more austerity on workers, carbon taxes passed on to consumers are a poor way to pursue environmental policy. Go after the super rich oil producers who are sitting on billions in oil wealth already. Be fair. To which Nero responds, in theory, a carbon tax does both. The, per the person responds to her, not in practice, however, because the oil producers will simply pass along the added expense until it hits the consumers who are already paying through the nose for energy. The French should follow the hashtag Superfund model where historical polluters are held financially responsible. And Nero responds, no. The theory is that people consume less energy-intensive products, lowering the sales and ultimately profitability of those companies. Can you identify anything wrong with this line of uh, reasoning, Liz? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the left theory uh, is that uh, climate change, uh, aggr aggressive climate change policy has to be a lot more comprehensive um, than just uh, a carbon tax, um, right? That um, part of the problem is that when you leave these companies alone, uh, and instead target consumers to try to get them to stop, um, you know, uh, paying the companies, basically. Um, the companies are still using their huge amounts of wealth to influence policy, for example, to uh, lobby against infrastructural changes uh, that would allow people to use public transport or green forms of transport and to lobby against uh, investment and innovation in, you know, green infrastructure. Um, and so if you're ignoring the companies and you don't absolutely aggressively go after them in their profit margins, you're going to allow them to keep doing that. And so the crunch is just going to uh, get harder and harder on working people who, of course, because they still have to get to work, are going to complain to manufacturers because there's nothing they can do from their level. There's only something that can be done from the political level. Uh, so this is the progressive argument for an extremely comprehensive, aggressive uh, climate policy that targets uh, the manufacturers and producers dirty energy, which Nirov should know. It just, the idea it, that the left is less comprehensive is is disturbing. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it just seems to me that, like, the, the, the idea that CAP basically exists to perpetrate, and, like, the whether it's Beto or Kamala or why I'm deeply skeptical of almost every Democratic politician or, or you know, 2020 hopeful, is that they all see these problems like climate change or energy consumption or health care or whatever, and the solutions for all of them involve individual choices in the marketplace. It's like that, right. like that can never, ever be touched or dealt with. Like the state can never actually take action to impose, you know, a, a, like a, a, you know, a change in our economy or a change in something. It always has to be individuals making choices in a market. Like they're there to protect the market. Like, and that's really what right. neoliberalism means. Right. It's like, God forbid that uh, there be any interference on the political level with these incredibly political organizations we know as corporations. Right. Their power is untouchable. I, you know, neoliberalism, the, the corporation, the capital is in control of the politics. And that's just the, that's just the fact of it, because they can't interfere in the markets. They don't want to interfere in the markets or they want to totally minimize how politics can interfere in markets. Uh, it means that the political powers that be are actually beholden to the, you know, hegemony of capital. And, and that's just capitalism. That's what it is. They're so captured by that ideology that it's reflected in their, their really cretinous lack of understanding of politics. When they lose, they just don't know what to do. I mean, we're seeing them flail around and all they can think is, well, what if we just, you know, got a white Obama? Because they, they can't think in any other terms because they can't, ima they can't imagine why people vote other than, well, Democrats are good people, and so they vote for Democrats, and Republicans are bad people, 
And so they vote for Republicans. Like a, something like a carbon tax to them, well, yeah, sure, it's going to cost you more and it's going to make your heart, life harder and you're already at the whims of the market and you know your wages are flat and you're, you can't afford a bunch of stuff and you have incredible debt because everything has really been put on your shoulders and the safety net's been destroyed. But you should be okay paying a carbon tax because that's going to help the environment and it makes you a good person for doing it. And so when people say, no, fuck you, my, my, you're not going to put another thing on top of me. Uh, meanwhile, I could see you using policy, uh, tax policy and regulatory policies to, to enrich the richest people right in front of my face and just take that. I'm not going to take it. And their heads just start sparking. They're like, no, that's good. You're a good person, right? And then if you say, no, fuck you, they're like, well, you're bad then. You're a bad person. Oh, well. I guess we're just going to have to have a few more fucking uh, Beyonce concerts. Not and only maybe that. We'll, we'll get a few young people to decide to be good because because of literal virtue signaling uh, in mass media. Not only that, it's like, uh, yeah, the, the, the fact that they don't support this or they're reacting badly about having to pay extra for gas or whatever uh, means you're a bad person. Not only that, trying to design policies or a political program to uh, that would appeal to these people who are frustrated and angry is also bad because yes. that means that you're catering exactly. to the bad people. Exactly. And they, like like Eric like that like it's this moral vision yes. that like that that um yeah that that trying to to design policies to make the lives of the bad people less miserable or hard no. makes you a bad person. Exactly. As well. They need to be punished. That's why these people f start frothing at the mouth every time Bernie says something about rural people. They hear rural and they just imagine fucking just clansmen and the the kid on the on the porch in deliverance <laughs> and they're just like oh, oh those are bad people why would you want to make their lives any better you should be fucking dropping depleted uranium on them those motherfuckers <laughs> uh you should be turning them into the guys from the hills have eyes and it's like yeah, well, why do we lose it's weird it's been one of the complaints about the protests in in france right that some of the protesters are on the right and so neoliberals will say like oh well it's sort of a red brown alliance it's really uh, fascists in the street, and then the leftists are helping them. It's like, well, one way that you could diffuse this is to respond to the substance of the protest. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like um, you know, the left is right here for you to ally with. We're and, certainly more similar, uh, but they don't want to do that. Well, I think I, France actually is an interesting example because, like, you know, coming up hot on the heels of uh, Macron is, of course, the Front National and yeah. the actual populist you know fascist right in france which like got very close to you know what is like 30 percent of the vote but almost right behind their heels was melanchon who's an actual communist right so the argument is now that like well if you're a liberal or a, one of the good people then any criticism you're doing of macron is de facto support for fascism and the right if you're dissatisfied with him or pointing out that he actually is a you know a grotesque uh you know like just a grotesque figure and a parody of everything that people hate about government and, you know, neoliberal politics, then that's a de facto support for fascism where it's like, if you are the liberal centrist, like you could always just ally with the left if you're interested in defeating the right. But I mean, this is a tale as old as time, right? Like if it, if it really comes down to it, if like, let's say like the general election was not between Macron and Le Pen, but Macron and Melenchon, or no, Le Pen and Melenchon, how many of these same people like would have been being like, hmm, you know what? As much as we don't like it, the responsible vote actually is for the fascists. Oh, absolutely. And uh, and get ready for it. If Bernie does get the nomination, if Bernie is well to the right of Melanchon. Uh, you're going to see a lot of respectable opinion that has spent four years horrified at Trump slowly r rationalize supporting him, uh, you know, holding their nose, of course. But or, or maybe not. I, I think a lot of these people, they won't outright say vote for Trump because they've gone. I mean, they've gone too far into like he's the most evil president of all time. But they're they are after hectoring everyone else. They're probably going to try to vote third party or not vote. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's the thing. There might be a B Bloomberg type. Yeah, thing. like and then all these people who spent their entire lives throwing darts at a fucking Nader uh, or Jill uh, Stein uh, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. They, they have Jill Stein fucking voodoo dolls. Uh, all of a sudden voting for you know, Manlet Bloomberg it, uh, is all of a sudden the the I, my conscience requires me to do this. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I can't vote for Bernie. I uh, think that 2020 is you know if Bernie gets anywhere near the nomination, there's going to be a lot of corporate money looking for a place to go, and you'll probably get an extremely stupid third party candidate like Bloomberg. Oh, it's going to um, roll. 
Well, we're all looking forward to it, and we love to see it. And uh, Liz, again, you have your orders from Conspiracy Headquarters. Just, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Um, you know, just keep, you know, uh, taking down. Take, just, just line them up, shoot them down. Beto Eric O'Rourke. Roger, copy that. Kamala, you know, uh, Roger, you were, you were greenlit for Xville. Liz Brunig of the Washington Post, thank you once again for joining us and our conspiracy. Thanks so much for having me on. <laughs> well, uh, thanks once again to uh, Liz Brunig. I'm sure no one will get mad about uh, that interview. <laughs> For, but um, all right. Let's uh, moving on. Uh, I want to talk about uh, my favorite uh, news item of the week, and by favorite, I mean I've been crying and shaking about it for you know since I heard the news. Where were you when you heard the Weekly Standard is shutting down? I was on the toilet reading the Weekly Standard. Yes, I was actually. I was making a phone call to Schnippers, <laughs> and uh, it's kind of you know. I'm not a religious person, but I believe in the supernatural. You know what I mean? I mean, we were, we were just got done talking about how, like, in the Trump era, uh, aggrieved liberals have basically found, like, every way to, like, almost become entirely right wing. Yeah. As long as it's not Trump. That's the beauty of Trump is that he allows them to differentiate themselves from what is considered popularly to be conservatism or right wingery. But in in substance, basically endorse all of those principles. And man, you could find no better example of that than the fucking, you know, gnashing of teeth and wailing among liberal media douchebags who are all just like, wow. Like, I'm seeing a lot of gloating over this. Uh, the Weekly Standard is actually a very intelligent and worthwhile publication that, you know, we need, you know, we need an outlet for intelligent conservative voices, you know, who stand up for sane conservatism. And it's like, you were talking about the magazine that is more responsible for the war in Iraq than like any. They literally started the war in Iraq. Like that's not an exaggeration. Like these guys were were the architects of Bush's war on terror and the invasion and occupation of Iraq. If that is sane conservatism to them, like Donald Trump has not done anything in office yet that's even one one thousandth as insane, dangerous, or murderous. As the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. Not even close. Not even close. And the Weekly Standard was the official mouthpiece for George W. Bush's foreign policy. Yeah. Well, and that is sane conservatism. You know, everybody fucks up once in a while. But remember, they, they've, you say that, oh, they had some bad articles, you know, about, you know, welfare or about 500 about the Iraq war and Stephen Hayes talking about how Muhammad Atta used to play, uh, you know, video games with uh, Uday Hussein. Uh, but you're forgetting that they gave a platform to authors like Gumbridge Van Winkle and <laughs> Dingelbert Hofstetter. I mean, these are real thinkers that well, we got yeah, to experience yeah, thanks to them. You can, you know, say that there is just idiotic crap. You know, Fred Barnes, all that stuff. You can Jonah Goldberg. Jonah, Jonah Goldberg. Jonah Goldberg. But, but what about the incredible art articles of Gordo Clownstep <laughs> and his, you know, you could just open up any weekly standard and there'd be articles from him like, you know, the case for not tipping your maid, uh, you know, why, why backgammon still matters. Just incredible, incredible stuff. Just the kind of content that you would kill for. And they did. And they were right to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, they literally killed for uh, the Weekly Standard. They were for right sure. to. They were 100% correct to. It was, we've lost a lot. You know, this, what is essentially like a alt-weekly for a uh, febophilic literature professors <sighs> in the Upper East Side, it, it, was, it was a major cultural force. This, this thing that was read by upwards of 70 people a week. <laughs> You know, if you take away Will and people who read the articles that Will posts, <laughs> Look. it's probably constituted 98% of their readership. Uh, you know, it just, it, I may not have agreed with everything, but when I could read a 17,000 word article about, you know, recounting a time where you played bridge with William F. Buckley and he made like a coy anti-Semitic remark and you had fun, it was, it was good shit. At a good time, man. That's what matters. Like the Weekly Standard has never made money. Whether it's like and all of these sort of vanity publications, like the Weekly Standard or the Free Beacon or whatever, these are just make work jobs for like 
boys with the roundest skull. <laughs> it's yeah, it's the Esplanade from season four of The Sopranos. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> these are just make work jobs that they literally like they like they hire these people and it's like they're like they're underwritten, so it's like they're paying people to read their articles about why George Bush is a modern Pericles. This is spoken like somebody who never read Lemuel Pitcairn's fashion <laughs> column, sir. Yeah, d- yeah, the sartorial column from Pitcairn. It was just. I will know he was witty too. Yeah. Like he, unfortunately, he he was one of the only people. I think the only person in America in 2015 who died of consumption. <laughs> <laughs> but when he said he he famously said to uh, Harry Harry Reid that he dressed like a Welshman, that was like I don't care who you are. That's funny. Yes, it's witty. Again, yeah. I just there could be there there can be no more clear dividing line. Again, if we're gonna talk, we were talking Liz about good people and bad people. I mean, we all draw these lines for ourselves, but for me, there can be no clearer line. If you think that there anything of value was lost in the Weekly Standard shuddering, shuddering I'm afraid there's no coming back for you. Toilet flush sound. I, I don't. I mean, yeah, yeah. You can you can do your purity test, but there was no stronger conservative bulwark against Donald Trump than the Weekly Standard. Who can forget? Whom among us can forget? When Marshall Good Cookie bravely came out against Donald Trump and said he's not serious about solving the Polynesian problem, that was courage. Any Democrat can resist Trump, okay. but for a man like Good Cookie, like, my God. I mean, people had to stand up and take notice. Okay, yeah, but like, he had to, man. You know, even if you read, if, in the, you know, if you take seriously the pretensions of these assholes that, 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 that you know, we... You know, it's important that we there still be outlets, even though they're only read by 70 people and yeah. then, you know, just like make no money and are essentially 70, 70 people. And then however many followers you have. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 it really is. <laughs> yeah. 80,000 and 70 people. <laughs> yeah. But like, I mean, no one's paying for this bullshit no, outside. Like, no. yeah, like 70 people in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Yeah. Uh, who are all war criminals or a Yeah. Or have gout like that. That's it. The idea that like. The idea that the Weekly Standard stood for like a sane conservative as opposed to Donald Trump. Well, like when people say Donald Trump is like the, the oh this is conservatism gone mad. Like okay, what they're talking about is they mean he uh, does um, nationalistic uh, sort of demagoguery and jingoism. The Weekly Standard did that to a T. Look up in their back catalog for like all of their articles about like George Bush as a Marvel statue, just the, a war presidency. You know, like rebel in chief. Yeah, like how, just how hard their dicks got about him being a war president. Um, they think, okay, Donald Trump, he just outright lies about things with no compunction whatsoever. Stephen Hayes, the current editor of the Weekly Standard, or now former, literally wrote a book called The, the Connection. Connection. The Connection about how Saddam Hussein was literally in cahoots with Al Qaeda and did nine eleven. Yep. Okay. Um. Then there is um. That Donald Trump, unlike you know, sane intellectual conservatism, is sort of a crass and vulgar populist. What? Bill Crystal personally got John McCain to not to have Sarah, to have Sarah Palin as his running mate, yes. and there yes. was a big Weekly Standard head like cover story on Sarah Palin titled "Is She the One We've Been Hoping For?" Yeah. Would it surprise you? The answer was yes. Yeah, she was the one they were hoping for. Well, at and, least he asked the question. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just it's it, like they're, it's the, the classic Van Poppen thing is that when they conjured Palin, they thought this is the person we can use to whip up the rubes enough to get into office. But thankfully, they'll be in a subservient position, and you know our, our guy John McCain will really be in charge. So we're going to still have our hand on the tiller, and then. Oh shit! It, you know the Sorcerer's Apprentice. They kept it got out of their hands, and it turned into Trump. And they're no longer they no longer have that sense that they have final say on policy. And so they're like, oh no! I was like, sorry, motherfucker. This is what it was all leading towards, and you recognize that. That's why you recognize the the hollowness of conservatism and the need to inject it with populist vigor. And that's why you fucking picked Sarah Palin. And it went out of your hands because this is the historical process. You're in the dustbin of history. Was uh, Van Poppen the guy who wrote their uh, bridge column? <laughs> yes. uh, no, I mean, it is all the people lamenting it, you know, as a thing against Trump. It's just like, do you know that Zoo, Zoo Cage and Lockers Monthly has come out strongly <laughs> against tigers roaming the streets? <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, the final thing, okay. The, okay, they outright lied and made up, made literally out of whole cloth, made up a case for going the, why Saddam was a threat to the world yep. in America, oh, which involved bullshit. not exaggerations or misinterpretations. Lying. 
conscious outright lying, which they have pretty much admitted amongst themselves. Oh yeah, they stoked jingoistic demagoguery during the all of the war on terror and about how you know anyone who was against it was disloyal. Well, how many posts? Or, how many fucking covers? Of the Weekly Standard had some grotesque bearded hippie with a stop the war sign that just said the traitors amongst us. Exactly. They uh, consciously stoked um, ignorant uh, Yahoo de- uh, populism and Sarah Palin. And finally, let's not forget, uh, Trump literally says, you know, shit like it's snowing right now. What happened to global warming? <laughs> and I, we're going to have the best air. I have the best air. The air is fantastic. And it's funny. things that are good, which Folks, I like. The air. It's so good. The and air is said, amazing. I mean, and but the Weekly Standard, again, had numerous cover articles about like how you know al gore the emperor has no clothes <laughs> like you know the arctic ice shelf is actually growing in size yeah. as it drifts closer to manhattan <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean yeah it's really funny that conservatism just boils down to a sort of social battle between two different types of stupid guys from manhattan and the dumber stupid guy won yeah and props to him good work dude. yeah he wanted yeah the, the, he the, wanted it less yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like, but the final point that must be made is they're not good writers, intelligent, thoughtful, or decent people at all. No. They're every bit as stupid, every bit as vulgar, and every bit as ignorant as like any Fox Nation TV show, as any fucking QAnon Yahoo. Yeah. They're better educated, maybe, but no one who has ever written for the Weekly Standard is a thoughtful person or a good writer in the slightest. Not only that, they are all fundamentally indecent, rotten people who should be dismissed out of hand entirely and should be treated as such. And the fact that their evil magazine is getting shutting down because literally nobody reads it and no one fucking cares is a fate far, 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 far lighter than what every one of these people who's ever even contributed an article to that piece of shit fucking rag deserves yeah it's like look at what happened to julia Stryker and count your fucking blessings that you just have to retire to the hamptons but i mean just to say finally you were talking about how insane it is to see liberals uh bemoaning the end of the weekly standard it's because of what we said earlier they want things to be back to normal they want republicans to be normal again they want they don't want this sort of unhinged pure uh populism all of it overseen by this clearly unstable senile maniac they want the same they they want a a worthy adversary uh who they parenthetically mostly agree with and they want to because the thing is is that because they mostly agree it it is necessary for them to keep politics in that kayfabe world that we've talked about where everyone speaks the language of politics they they keep their speech very uh corralled intentionally within acceptable margins because as soon as you start coloring outside the lines uh the the hollowness of it starts to reveal itself and as soon as popular forces enter the political realm it just destabilizes that uh that system between the 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 bipartisan uh, consensus on on economics uh from the left and the right which is why they see them as equal threats regardless of where they are in this arbitrary you know uh dyad uh, and, and it's it's like the, but it's up to the left really to to figure out how to take control of it because otherwise you can't let these liberals be in charge of it because they're just going to close their eyes and wish that things would go back and then you're going to blink and the fucking Nazis are going to be in everywhere they're going to be in charge of everything. I mean, I want to give an actual example here of uh, the Weekly Standard and what I mean that like these people not only are they stupid, not smart. And every bit as evil as Trump, and in fact, in my opinion, considerably more evil than him. This is what we're losing. This is an editorial written by Robert Kagan and William Bill Crystal in in February of two thousand four, right around the time that the wheels were like really starting to come off the Iraq War, which again was their creation and their responsibility. Six 1, months had passed, and six more months. Yeah. No fucking weapons had been discovered. It was a really crucial six months. I remember that. This is called the right war for the right reason. Oh yeah. This is awesome. their attempt to like. To, to, to like keep pumping that corpse, uh, or million corpses, I suppose. Uh, I just want to read just a little bit from this. From the, like, this is their best case for it. One reason critics have been insisting the administration claim the threat from Iraq was imminent, we believe, is that it's fairly easy to prove that the danger to the United States was not imminent. 
But the central thesis of the anti-war argument, as it was advanced before the war, asserted that the threat from Iraq would not have been imminent even if Saddam had possessed every conceivable weapon in his arsenal. So think about what they're saying there to rescue uh, like their <laughs> integrity. Is that like, now, now, it's very easy to advance the case that Saddam Hussein was not an imminent threat to the United States, but the people advancing that case would have believed that even if they had all of the made-up weapons yeah, that we said he did. Exactly. Which, by the way, I still fucking would have. <laughs> Remember, the vast majority of arguments against the war assumed that he did not have these weapons. But those weapons, it was argued, did not pose an imminent threat to the nation because Saddam, like the Soviet Union, could be deterred. Indeed, the fact that he had the weapons, some argued, was all the more reason why the United States should not go to war. On Meet the Press on February 8th, Tim Russert asked the president whether the war in Iraq was a war of choice or a war of necessity. The president paused before responding, asking Russert to elaborate as if unwilling to accept the dichotomy. He was right. After all, fighting a war of choice sounds problematic. Indeed, by the Nuremberg standards, it is not just problematic, <laughs> but a war crime of the highest order. Feeling V gross right now. <laughs> but how many of our wars have been, strictly speaking, wars of necessity? How often did the country face immediate peril and destruction unless <laughs> war was launched? Was World War I a war of necessity? Was World War II before the attack on Pearl Harbor or afterwards with respect to fighting Germany and Europe? Was the Spanish-American War a war of necessity? Was the Korean War? What? Never mind Vietnam, the were... Dominican Republic, Grenada, Panama, the, but... Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, and Kosovo. Yeah, the... What about the first Gulf War? The... Many have argued that Saddam could the... and indeed was but... contained in Kuwait those... and that he could have eventually but been forced wars... to retreat by economic sanctions. Wars... In some sense, what? all of these wars were wars of choice. But yeah. when viewed in the context of history and international circumstances... They were all based on judgments about the costs of inaction, the benefits of action, and on strategic calculations that action then would be far preferable to action later in less favorable circumstances. In other words, war was necessary to our national interest, if not absolutely necessary, to the immediate protection of the homeland. But those were bad. Those are literally the most that's, optional wars that's in just history. That's a list of <laughs> massive crimes. Yeah. Millions of people killed for no fucking reason. He's naming like he's he's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, if you say this is an optional war, what about, you know, the war of the Chile's parking lot in 1983? It's just like the most optional wars, the least essential ones. It's what a great we are going to miss a lot. In this I case, already miss it. In this case, we believe that war would have eventually would have come eventually because of the trajectory that Saddam was on. Just like Granada. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or Haiti or the case. Dominican yeah. Republic. Mm -hmm. Dominican Republic. Spanish-American War. Yeah. We were we were just gonna get fucking flocked by armadas. It was gonna <laughs> suck. Yeah, uh, they were they were building a giant slingshot in Madrid that <laughs> yeah. had the power to launch a. a, a crate of Madeira across the Atlantic. Yeah, if you yeah, if you're if you're eating gumbo instead of paella, thank a marine. <laughs> and he goes, "So what about those stockpiles? The failure to find them and now David Kay's claim that they did not exist at the time of the invasion last Oops. year. This has led many to maintain the entire war was fought on false pretenses. We have addressed that claim." <laughs> okay. All right, that's Never enough for me. Then. All right, let's and get lunch. Speaking of the, the the search for his non-existent weapons of mass destruction, and again, in this article, what they do is they focus only on anthrax and chemical weapons and elide the fact that what they were actually selling was a viable nuclear program that was within days of launching like an act. Oh, Remember, yeah. We don't want the smoking gun to be in the form cloud. of a Absolutely. mushroom cloud. Yeah. A line written by everyone's new best friend, David Frum. <laughs> Whatever the results of that search, it will continue to be the case that the war was worth fighting. Good. I'm and, and that it was necessary for the people of Iraq. The war put an end to three decades of terror and suffering. Woo! Ooh, that well, right. That's an, okay. Good, yeah. Good thing. Good thing the war caused no terror and Not suffering at all. for the Iraq people. And Iraq Iraqi people. Pe people say it's doing the best out of any of the countries. It's it, more and more. People more and more. I, you know what? I've had, I have a good authority. The, they're going to revalue the dinar any day now. <laughs> <laughs> the mass graves uncovered since the end of the war alone are sufficient justification for it. And what about the ones created by <laughs> <Yeah>. it? <laughs> Assuming the United States remains committed to helping establish a democratic government in Iraq, that will be a blessing both to the Iraqi people and to their neighbors. As for those neighbors, the threat of Saddam's aggression, which hung over the region for more than two decades, has finally been eliminated, mainly on behalf of Iran, which yeah. is hilarious. 
the prospects for war in the region have been substantially diminished by our action. Again, this is written in 2004. <laughs> that all, well, I mean, all name fiction. one yeah. major war in the <laughs> yeah. region after that. This is all checking out. It is also, this is the end here. It is also becoming clear that the Battle of Iraq has been an important victory in the broader war in which we are engaged. A war against terror, against weapons proliferation, and for a new Middle East. Yeah. Already, other terror-implicated regimes in the region where developing weapons of mass destruction are feeling pressure, and some are beginning to move in the right direction. Libya has given up its weapons of mass destruction program. Let's yeah, go, go, dude! Call back to the Adam Curtis episode, but uh, for true fans of the show will remember, the Libya giving up its weapons of mass destruction thing was the ultimate kayfabe by Gaddafi, you know, still number one in, in our hearts the green book <laughs> still the greatest book yeah. like his sons it's are li- harry potter they literally said like we gave up our entire we just said that we gave up our imaginary program to get like sanctions lifted or to be have tony blair come and visit the country and yeah. be like they're good now yeah it's the best lying brag ever yeah. yo no shit i actually had like yeah 1500 ballistic missiles but i gave that shit up <laughs> i'm done with- it's the guy who's like yeah i used to be in the fucking cia but the i can't ca- kill people anymore dude no the, shit the i have ca- a daughter the libya giving up its weapons of mass destruction program was one of the purest instances of kayfabe yeah. horseshit in the world. Yeah. And it was like, Gaddafi, they're just like, well, it's not looking good in Iraq. There were no weapons of mass destruction. But what if we could get Gaddafi to say he's giving up his nuclear yeah. weapons program? Yeah. And then and then guess what? It worked. He was Gaddafi for a short period of time was accepted back into the international community. Interesting evening with an interesting man. As <laughs> McCain said. Yeah. Just recreated Paris in Benghazi with Colonel Gaddafi and his <laughs> and his friends. From and this is the closing line. From Iran to Saudi Arabia, liberal forces seem to have been encouraged. We are paying a real price in blood and treasure in Iraq, but we believe that it is already clear as clear as such things get in the real world, that the price of the liberation of Iraq has been worth it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Just think, like, where are we going to get... Where are we going to get these kind of things? Where are we going to get thousands and thousands, like thousands of words of apologia for, you know, probably the greatest disaster of the 21st century? I mean, where are we going to get the articles calling Trump a pussy for not bombing Iran? Or literally saying, hey... If you're going to call the war in Iraq a war crime, then you might as well call Korea and Vietnam war crimes, <laughs> I mean, buddy. If we're getting silly. I mean, okay, you can you can uh, cherry pick articles like that that constituted about 75% of their output. <laughs> but, you know, what about what about the literary wit? What about the cultural aspects of uh, Weekly Standard? Yeah. So many dudes wearing capes going <laughs> and complaining that people were texting at the musicals that they went to. Dude, yeah, it was the only place where you could get a vampire's perspective of how hard it was to see a matinee. Dude, where else could you get, you know, PJ, oh, just a, a delightfully witty PJ O'Rourke column about, like, you know, uh, how his son won't stop listening to the damn uh, Zune <laughs> three player. Oh, good PJ O'Rourke is so fun. When he talks about Dude, epic bourbon, yo, PJ, oh, yo, man. Yo, PJ O'Rourke is so funny has always been funny is seriously one of the funniest writers and if you don't think that if you like actually think that pj o'rourke is actually one of the least funny or entertaining people who's ever existed <laughs> then buddy you're robbing yourself of just good comedy yeah, yeah. I, I feel bad for you did you know that Eddie, like, even his he, son beto thinks that he's really funny <laughs> did, did you know <laughs> <laughs> well you know uh now that weekly standards out of business we will be spending the entirety of our revenue to give a platform to pj o'rourke yeah Distributing he's getting, PJ he's getting, work in every language in the world. Yeah. Well, sorry, James Adomi, and this is we didn't want to tell you this way, but you've been <laughs> yeah. fired. All of the cold opens and and, and impressions and stuff. That's all going to be PJ. For all now. hosts are replaced by PJ work. <laughs> all guests, uh, just PJ all the time. You know, you people complaining that we need to do more premium episode. We're getting five a week, every <laughs> workday. PJ work. Yep. Let's go. Well, I got I got one last thing for us here today, and you know, again, we will all miss the Weekly Standard so so much. But you know who will, no one will miss more than the Weekly Standard? Being ruled by wasps. The white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, oh, folks, are, are just genetically predisposed to be our benevolent rulers. But with George H.W. Bush, he was the last wasp. It's so it was like He was like the last African like, uh, white rhino. Yeah. Was the, he was the last wasp, and now there are no more. Yeah, and we're gonna miss them, guys. And you know, like a white African rhino, he was killed by Donald Trump Jr. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm speaking, of course, about Ross Douthit. He's like, we haven't checked in with Ross and a, a boss Ross in a long time. You know what? I, I've always said about Ross, um, because I miss him. Of course. I like a, I feel the way about Ross Douthat, the way that Dana White feels about, you know, MMA fighters who aren't that good, but sort of lose or win in spectacular, exciting fashion. Ross may not be the best, but he leaves it all out there. We haven't done a Ross column in a while, so you know, I, I think this is a treat for you guys. You know, Ross started out as a major character for us, and I think it's time to bring him back with his opinion piece to the New York Times. Why we miss the Wasps. Their more meritocratic, diverse, and secular successors rule us neither as wisely nor as well. Diverse. So he's just complaining that there aren't as many white people in the ruling class anymore. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, cool. Good to know. Well, as we know from Ross's book about Harvard, you know, Asians, they may be smart. But they're weird. But they're very cliquish and inscrutable. <laughs> it's, very, dead it's, wood, yeah. it's very the hard. Celestials. <laughs> it's, it's like when, you, when we're ruled by the meritocratic Asians, because, you know, they're the best at taking tests and yeah. you know, doing math and whatnot. Uh, when we're ruled by the, 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 the Asian ruling yeah. class, they may be competent, but again, it's very hard to scrute. Yeah. <laughs> what do they want it's from just us? This eternal mystery. <laughs> Man, <laughs> damn, I try to scrute this shit and I can't. <laughs> I, yeah, I just love that it's like it's like a cut scene of Steve from Deadwood. Yeah, <laughs> they are in their clique and they won't let a Harvard well, man. <laughs> 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 so this is what Ross Douthat has to say in defense of our. Wasp ruling class. You know, the good old days in America. Yeah. We just came from Princeton. Wasn't it better? Oh, we my God. By yes. Everyone, like the graduating class of Princeton, Harvard, and Yale. When we were ruled by the Dulles brothers, the Niles and Fraser Crane of, of uh, war the military industrial yeah. uh, complex. You know, we used to be ruled by a different type of cousin guy. It was, you would be like, you know, instead of, you know, you know my cousin fucked Betty Page, it was like, Oh, my cousin uh, knocked over three governments in Latin America for a fruit company. <laughs> but you were telling the truth. The, the wasp cousin guys were just guys that fucked their cousins. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, no shit. Me and my cousin came all over each other. We don't even need a woman. Okay, so this is what Ross says. The nostalgia flowing since the passing of George H.W. Bush has many wellsprings. Admiration for the World War II generation and its dying breed of warrior politicians. <laughs> I love warrior <laughs> politicians. Oh, yeah. Just a bunch of William Wallaces. Yeah, I think of w warriors. I think of fucking George H.W. W. Bush. The usual belated media affection for moderate Republicans. The contrast between the elder Bush's foreign policy successes and the failures of his son. And the contrast between any honorable honorable politician and the current occupant occupant of the Oval Office. All right, for the beginning, we can just dis uh, this is one of those ones where you you just destroy it out of the gate because he says we, and he never defines that, and he never he's talking whoa all these outpourings who it's all the media. Well, the I media are the only people who give a shit about this. Well, I think the funny thing to point out is that Ross Douthat is 100% a wasp. Well, yeah, he is. I don't take he his talks, religious... He's, he's very proud of it. Well, I mean, he has that his phony religious conversion to his Catholicism, which is like, you know, that that's his one, you know, check mark against it, but I don't really take that seriously. So he's just like, it was better when people like me from Connecticut ran the country. Yeah, no, he's saying, but he's, saying, but he's, he's dressing it in the idea that he's, He's commenting on this national wellspring of nostalgia, which I'm sorry, mo entirely the media, maybe like a third of lib Democratic voters because they are on that civility shit and they are so traumatized by Trump that they want any they want any Republican they can kind of grasp onto and think this person's better than Trump. So that's true. But I'd say the majority of Democratic voters uh, are lukewarm to to. Uh, disdainful of him. Obviously, people who don't vote don't give a fuck who that guy was. Who's, who's that fucking grandpa? That old bitch. And, as and then yeah. half of the fucking Republican base thinks that he killed Kennedy. Well, he probably did. I mean, George H. W. Bush. You may not respect him for you know being a moderate. It's never good to be a moderate or anything, bitch ass. Uh, World War Two. You know, what kind of chump fights another man's war? Uh, kids suck, losers. But he fucking he capped his enemies. And he moved coke. 
to yeah. be the baller, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, you have to respect. Wait, he was the greatest toll wait. trafficker in American. He was. History. He had that. Yeah, yeah. F- freeway HW. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was Freeway's plug. Yeah. He's the greatest of all time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why <laughs> undefeated? Why we miss the plug? <laughs> damn. Damn, I missed the plug. <laughs> greatest. I mean, we. Uh, everyone made fun of Navy Pier in Chicago for putting a big dumb picture of his old head on our stupid ferris wheel <laughs> but i think it's actually pretty cool for chicago to officially honor the greatest coke trafficker in american history but two of the more critical takes on bush nostalgia got closer to the heart of what is what was being mourned in distant hindsight with his death writing in the atlantic peter beinart described the elder bush as the last president deemed legitimate by both our country's warring tribes before the age of presidential sex scandals plurality winning and popular vote losing chief executives and white resentment of the first black president did george hw bush like cheat on barbara all the time he was a huge horn dog he was a coxman he was a massive cheater all the time in fact it came out during the i believe the 88 campaign but it just never caught any kind of uh a larger thing because you didn't have somebody like jennifer flowers who was giving interviews or something but he was absolutely a known cheater to the washington press corps and of course, r- talk about racial resentment. Fucking Willie Horton had he and him and Lee Atwater ran an explicitly racist campaign in 1988. Also in the Atlantic, Franklin Four, Franklin what? Four, uh, four, ugh. Franklin Four, just a, mo- a motherfucker wrote an article in the New York Times, basically to talk to respond to Peter Beinart and Franklin Four. What? what this is the most. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna call him. What? Fra- this I'm, isn't I'm exciting. Gonna, I'm gonna call him Franklin. It's just Fo- what are we doing? What are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling him Franklin Hoor. <laughs> Franklin Hoover described the He's subtext. He's more like Franklin 8, if you feel me. <laughs> Franklin Hoover. Well, Franklin for what? New Republic, right? Is he yeah, still yeah, the New yeah, Republic? Yeah. No, the Atlantic. Oh, the Atlantic. Okay. Describe, Literally the same thing. It's the, all the same money laundering operation for the fucking Church of Scientology and the fucking Qatari royal family. <laughs> described the subtext of Bush nostalgia as a fondness for a bygone institution known as the establishment. Hardened. Who? Who? <laughs> them. <laughs> but I mean, like, but who is who is having this buy on nostalgia? Me. Name names. <laughs> Felix. Me. I am, dude. Felix. Felix. Give Felix. me something other than these fucking preppy dickheads. Can Me, just, dude. I'm can sad. I, can I just describe the establishment? How Franklin Hoare describes them. <laughs> the establishment are people who are hardened in the cold New England boarding school. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, dude. Liter- Stop it. Yo, yo, you can't use that word. Yo, my man literally said they got hard in New England boarding <laughs> schools. Yo, they yo, were I literally got- molested. Is that's what he means? Yo, I got dumb brain at Exeter. <laughs> Hardened. No, he means they got richly met. It's the same. It, the, it's, it's the Br- they imported the British ruling class I, style. I don't know how much ex- identically they like Andover and Exeter copied exactly the British boarding school system, but they also said acculturated by the late night rituals of skull and bones, sent off to the world with a sense of noblesse oblige. All right, literally my, fr- they- my friends have jacked off on me enough, and now I feel honored to serve the He's world. He's talking about a life, a childhood of separation from your family and ritual humiliation by your peers. And that's supposed to make you a good leader and not a lizard brain psychopath? And that's how you, you know, overthrow the Demo- our Benz yeah, for the United Fruit right. Company. Mossadegh. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking of Geronimo's skull when we overthrew Mossadegh. Put simply, Americans miss Bush because we miss the wasps. Once again, no. No, every time he says that, I say, fuck you. Who says we miss him? For su- who are suggests that this nostalgia is mostly bunk since the wasps were often bigots, since their cultivation of noblesse oblige was really about preserving a place at the high table of American life. And since so many of their virtues are superficial, a matter of dressing nicely while practicing imperialism or writing lovely thank you notes while they outsource the dirty work of politics to race baiting operatives. Correct. However, right. one of the lessons of the age of meritocracy is that building a more democratic and inclusive ruling class is harder than it looks, and even perhaps a contradiction in terms. You think? How about we just get rid of yeah. the ruling class and replace it with another class? Hmm. I don't maybe know. A, a working class or something? I don't know. Kind? There's like a different class that could be in charge, maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. You can get rid of the social registers and let women into your secret societies and privilege SATs over recommendations from the rector of Justin. And, Which, by and the, the way, they have not done. These motherfuckers are still... And the headmaster still... of St. Grottlesex. These guys are still... <laughs> 
the ones who get into these schools anyway. And George Bush did go to Harvard. Yeah. You know, and you still end up with something that is clearly a self-replicating upper class, a powerful elite filling your schools and running your public institutions. Yeah. Weird how that works. I know. If only there was some sort of um, God. thinker that sort of described yeah, how a, a, a class-based system yeah. of power yeah. works and replicates itself yeah. such that it actually doesn't matter if it's a wasp in charge right. or some sort of you know weirdo Catholic convert. Yeah. Sort of like how all all class societies are a dictatorship of one class over the other, and the, ours is one where uh, what are they called? Starts with a B. The, the, they're the ones, and, and they are a class dictatorship, and that expresses itself in economics, and then somehow also in the political class. We're talking about Jay Sakai, right? Yeah, that's the author. Yeah, Google settlers. So if some of Elder Bush's mourners wish we still had a WASP establishment, their desire probably reflects a belated realization that certain of the old establishment's vices were inherent to any elite, that meritocracy creates its own forms of exclusion, and that the WASPs had virtues that their successors have failed to inherit or revive. Those virtues included, again, the spirit of noblesse oblige and a personal austerity and piety that went beyond the thank you notes and boat shoes and prep school chapel going. No, it didn't. Wrong. It absolutely did not. Where is his where, citation, motherfucker? Citation needed. When you're putting your cigar out on your fucking uh, saddle boy's fucking forehead. A spirit that trained the most privileged children for service, not just success, that sent men like Bush into combat alongside the sons of farmers and mechanics in the same way. He was a fucking Air Force officer. He was not alongside the sons of farmers he and mechanics. He was not, and he picked it because he thought it would be a great adventure. He said the Knights of the Sky. The Knights sky. of the Sky. Yeah. It was a, it was a fun lark for, for a blue blood shithead. To be fair, a lot of them did die. <laughs> the, the, the death rate not for enough. those pilots. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not enough of the officer class yeah. of the Western powers died in World War II. That's a de- absolutely true. No question. Um, blah, blah, blah. The WASP virtues also included a cosmopolitanism that was often more authentic than our own performative variety, a cosmopolitan that co- cosmopolitanism that coexisted with white man's burden racism, but also sometimes transcended it. Again, when? You're just saying it. Because You're for every shit. Brahmin bigot, there was an Arabist or China hand or Hispanophile well, there was another. What's up? Of, <laughs> there was another one of those yeah. files. Yeah, another well. file. <laughs> There's another file. Wait a minute. So he's saying that oh, they weren't racist. They were things like uh, Arabist. Yeah, you mean those freaks who would just wear a turban and put filo dough on their dick and fuck somebody on a <laughs> yeah, Turkish yeah. rug? Oh, oh, dude, you think I'm racist? I literally only pay 13 year olds this specific ethnicity to go pee pee on me in a tent. <laughs> he goes. They understood the non-American world better than some of today's shallow multiculturalists. So Ross is like. Like, have again, you ever been pissed on, buddy? <laughs> He's literally talking about like like the, a Lawrence of Arabia figure, like a guy like who was administering imperialism and like put a fucking started dressing like a Bedouin. Yeah, and actually, un, he actually understood their culture a lot better than a lot of these uh, woke SJWs. people today who actually won't fuck a teenage boy. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Have you ever paid an Iranian bodybuilder to do a riot so you could overthrow their president? Um, excuse me. Have you ever had a Latin 10th generation syphilis that breaks when you're 25 and you just walk around in an outfit and going, I fancy myself a son of Siam? (laughs) (laughs) Has that ever happened to you? You can study as much as you want, but until you do that, dude. What were their fucking accomplishments that what is it what did this worldliness accomplish coups and 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 uh and dictatorships that have created every fucking problem we have now that he's bemoaning our current elite can't handle they're all legacies of these motherfuckers from from uh the the, the central american dictatorships that have gone given birth to the dreaded caravan and and, and uh immigrant issues to the middle east being turned into a just a giant fucking war zone uh that's all their fucking doing they are they were the ones who bequeath all of this to us so like ross talks about you know some of the problems and you know wasp habits or whatever but here's where we really enter his mind palace and he goes it's possible to imagine adaptation rather than surrender as a different wasp strategy across the 60s and 70s in such a world the establishment would still have admitted more blacks jews catholics and hispanics and more women to its ranks but it would have done so as a self-consciously elite crafting strategy Dude, yo, I love yo, I love when I'm crafting elites. When I when I, I, I like acquire items to craft a, a new uh, Hispanic Jewish elite, it still, <laughs> it still has plus wasp ten uh, nobles oblige stats. God damn, the Japanese Indian elite is the hardest item to find in the game. So wait, you can so complete so many te- quests. Uh, 
so basically he's saying the problem is that not, not enough people from different backgrounds were brought to these institutions as kids to have their bare asses paddled with a plank from Nathan Hale's gallows. <laughs> Whoa, I'm a fucking Arabist over here. I'm getting, yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting the fucking pee pee on me from all these 13 year old Bedouin boys. It's like bada bing, I give him the coin, bada boom, I'm covered in child urine. Yeah, I got, I have, I have inbreeding caused mental illness. At the same time, it would have retained both its historic religious faith instead of exchanging Protestant rigor for a post-Christian social gospel and soft pantheism. Again, this is just all of Ross's own fucking like boogeyman that like <laughs> the uh, like the elite now it's fucking pantheists. I'm just there's sick. nobody is a fucking I'm fucking pantheist. sick of seeing Kamala like... Harris praying to the fucking snow god. To this Bob. is like... every every December first. This is like Alex Jones shit. This oh. is the, they're worshiping ball. <laughs> Shut up. Oh, dude. It's oh my god, I got invited to the D the D triple C's Walpurgis knock party. It fucking sucks. Oh my god. He I goes, have to I have to meet Tom Perez at Stonehenge. So he's saying like he <laughs> sucks. Doing, he's doing a he's doing a character build where you could like trade wasp uh, DNA for wasp social characteristics like Protestant rigor. And their self-denying culture, which is just like, again, like that's where you shake, like Felix, like you said, you shake your wife's hand on your wedding night and then don't talk to her or make eye contact for 30 years and you lose your, like your lips actually are surgically removed from your skull and that you just like, just sort of drink gin and um, pee blood for the rest of your life. Yeah, it's good, dude. It's good. It makes you a good person. <laughs> And he goes, the goal would have been to keep piety and discipline embedded in the culture of a place like Harvard rather than the mix of performative self-righteousness and raw ambition that replaced them. Ross, you wrote a book about your time at Harvard that was all about your performative self-righteousness and raw ambition. He is quoted as saying he wants to be the world, America's richest writer well, when he was going to Harvard. And I'm sorry, what is your, all his religious bullshit, if not performative self-righteousness? Yeah, that's every, every comic column of his. Such an effort might also have had a spillover effect on politics. It's de rigueur for liberals to remit the decline of the Rockefeller Republicans or the I don't. Yeah, or the compromises that moderate Northeastern Wasp, uh, Northeastern Wasp like George H. W. Bush made with Sunbelt populism. But a Wasp establishment that couldn't muster the self confidence to hold on to Harvard and Yale was never likely to maintain its hold on a mass political organization like the GOP. Whereas an establishment that still believed in its mission within its own ivied bastions might have been a, seen as a more politically imposing in the wider world. Instead of seeing its last paladin, a war hero and statesman in a grand American tradition, dismissed in the boomer era as a wimp. That is absolute pharmaceutical grade gibberish. He is saying that the, that the populist, the rise of the populist right that started in the 60s with Goldwater would have somehow been stopped if there'd been sort of a, a, a hybrid vigor infused wasp establishment to fight it. It, it. I can't even form any words at this point. I mean, how do you, what do you think politics is? Like, what do you really think is the driving factor? Is it, he, there's no place in any of this for just the material reality of like, the the, the 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 shifts of American the economy and and where power flowed when with the rise of you know the, the energy uh, economy of, of of Texas or whatever the way that shifted uh, financial uh, influence from from the East Coast financiers to the West like that has nothing to do with who who how many people in DC could like uh, lift their fucking pinky finger when they're drinking tea I mean these are these are Titanic. Uh, material shifts and that that is what determines the the political superstructure he has this perfectly inverted understanding of politics where it's just the the need for wasps to be imposing enough would keep the rest of us rabble in line i mean i think the entire point of this column is that it's just like a giant like what if scenario they're like what if when i went to college like it was still cool to be a wasp and like, uh, you know, I was as successful as Mark Zuckerberg by channeling all of my college age anxieties into something other than some weird uh, religious mania and New York Times columns. Yeah. Instead of, uh, you know, part of the pantheistic, sun worshipping, <laughs> multicultural elites we got at the Ivy League, yeah. Ross could have been, you know, 
accepted by the Wasp, and he could have been the next Zuckerberg, except he makes Tinder that connects uh, 28-year-old virgins to 13-year-old boys in Western Asia, as it is now called. Or what if, what if? hear me out now, what if the neoliberal turn hadn't happened and just atomized and dissolved all social bonds and, 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 radical, and made politics vastly more uh, populist because, uh, because people were much more desperate through basically all strata of society except for his precious little grouping. Ugh, Jesus fucking Christ. What if, what if there was a special type of white person that wore 17 layers to have afternoon gin with his wife and has sex with her once and it produces seven awful kids all named Neil? <laughs> uh, I mean, he goes on to, you know, he's just saying, like, you know, we should learn from the best things of the wasps, which was, you know, all of the democratic governments that they overturned and all the um incest and uh repression that they uh, it's amazing also did. that he can't muster a single example in that entire article about what actually what actually was good about them being in charge other than just broad what, no, values what, no, what he, he means about. is like what was good about them being in charge is that like they reflected things that ross likes to see which is like uh never enjoying yourself yeah uh and like being sort of like austere like in both personality repressed and repressed lunatic yeah. while you're, like I said, overthrowing democratic governments all over the world. He goes on to uh, quote an essay from something called the Hedgehog Review, which I'm not going to read. But he just says, uh, if we would learn from their lost successes in our own era of misrule, reconsidering again, what were their successes? I'm not clear from, from reading not this a article. Single example. Uh, reconsidering this idea that a ruling class should acknowledge itself for what it really is and act accordingly might be a fruitful place to start. I think a fruitful part, place to start would be recognizing who the ruling class is and uh, getting rid of them entirely. Well, that's the thing. And that's what's always frustrating about Dalton Columns is because he, he's pointing out that there is a real contradiction there and that, that, the, that the diversity solution to to the perceived problem of a, of a out of touch ruling class is in fact not one because you're just replacing one ruling class with another, uh, and that that's that the contradictions are still there, and that as long as, as and, and especially in an era when uh, when material conditions are deteriorating and where politics has basically stopped any pretense of being able to control the economic destinies of people we were basically throwing our hands up and said, look, we'll be your rulers, but we can't actually make anything better. Everything's to the markets to decide. Sorry about that. That is an unsustainable situation, and that's going to get swept away. Uh, and he kind of has this vague understanding that that's the case, but because he is a fucking deluded dipshit, he just can't grasp it. So instead he's like, well, what if we just went back in time and uh, had made sure it killed Jeb Bush and replaced him with a more competent version of himself so that he could have beaten Trump in 2016, and then everything would be okay. And I mean, I think it just comes down wasp. to, like, Ross is a wasp, but um, he'll never really be a part of them, but, like, he wants, the, you know, he, he views himself as an outsider because of his weird religious mania, um, but he still wants to be part of, he, he, he wants to fuck Geronimo's skull. Well, the thing is, is that he, he, I, he probably fucking affects that Catholicism partially to create an aura of being an outsider because that gives him uh that that's a self it's um it's self-regarding because you know to be a uh, sort of part of this elite you know you're you're a, you're a fucking wodehouse character but if you're have some weird thing off you know you don't want to be gatsby you want to be nick Carraway, right and that he gets to be he gets to be part of it but also have uh self-awareness and a separation from it and an irony that makes him more interesting than just these boring wasps. It's themselves. almost like a a shallow. I don't know what's the form of politics that's like based on who you are, right, or yeah. like like something like like your your yeah. driver's license policy, right, your right, ID, yeah. I, like ID, yeah, yeah, your identi yeah. identity, identity, identity politics. That's, just, that's, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, identity politics. Meanwhile, I would rather be ruled by literal, actual wasps, <laughs> giant interdimensional space wasps that had us all work in the sugar caves than these motherfuckers again. I would rather have that wasp from Mandy sting my neck after <laughs> LSD is dropped into my eyes. Well, yeah, that just looked like fun. Actually, that, that looked pretty dope, yeah. actually. Yeah. So uh, that's what I'm going to be doing uh, every time Ross Stout that uh, writes a column. Yeah. Just so Right in the neck. Always good to check in on Ross again, and always good to uh, check in with you, the listener. Yeah, Once hi, again. guys. Hey, how you doing?